Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this lecture, we will examine the evolution of prehistoric sharks until the origin of the modern sharks, the neo during the early Jurassic. In the next few video lectures, we will look at the evolution of sharks and fish after the Devonian. As we mentioned previously, the chondrichthys, the group that includes chimerids, rays, and sharks, also include a very diverse group of extinct Ancanthodian fish from the Devonian. The first really advanced members of the group that more closely resembles a modern shark appear during the latest Devonian. It's a really unique fossil called Cladoslichia from the Cleveland Shale of Ohio. The unique fossil preserves the impression of the body, and since sharks are composed of a mostly cartilaginous endoskeleton, we often only have the teeth and scales as fossils. The unique preservation of the fossil of Cladoslichia clearly shows large pectoral fins and a very shark-like body. During the Mississippian period, there were some very strange prehistoric sharks. In the group Ciamoriformes, or the Ciamorids, we have these strange dinera, which looks like Cladoslexia, but has a weird whip-like extension of the pectoral fin called a metaterygial axis. Another bizarre Seymoriformes is the strange Falcadius from the Mississippian period of Montana, which has a strange head spine, which is found only in males and may have been used to attract the lady prehistoric sharks. A lot of our knowledge of Mississippian sharks comes from the fantastic fossils of the Bear Gulch limestone and the Heath Formation in Montana, which preserves the body impressions of a wide diversity of prehistoric sharks, and it gives us a unique insight into early shark evolution. The most bizarre of the Seymoriformes sharks are Acmonostithiax and Stethiacanthius, which have these strange brush-like dorsal spines that are found only in male sharks. Note that you can sex fossil sharks when preserved as impressions because males have claspers, which are used for internal fertilization of females, whereas females lack the claspers. Often in, in impressions of fossil sharks, you can make out the claspers which contain cartilage spines. These claspers would make sexual intercourse with female sharks likely a painful process for the female. The next weird and wacky prehistoric shark group are the Eugenodontiformes, which are mostly known from just fossilized teeth. The strangest of the bunch has to be the world teeth of Helicoprion, which is known from the Pennsylvanian and Permian of Idaho. Many researchers over the years have tried to reconstruct how Helicoprion might have looked like with these weird, whirly teeth. Three styles of reconstructions have been proposed. One has the teeth growing out of the jaw with the spiral outside of the mouth. The second features the teeth uh, kind of like a circular saw with the teeth growing into the lower jaw. And the third reconstruction has the teeth uh, fully inside the mouth near the throat. Now, recent CT scans of fossils have revealed that the orientation of the whorl was such that new, larger teeth were formed in the back of the mouth, with older and smaller teeth curving downward and eventually folding into the lower jaw. The shark likely looks something like this reconstruction by Ray Troll. 
The Eugenodontiformes and the next group, the uh, Pelodontiformes, are more closely related to modern chimerids or holocephali group than they are to modern sharks and rays. The Pelodontiformes are a really weird group of prehistoric sharks that look more like strange tropical reef fish with bulbous bodies and very powerful jaws and teeth for eating hard-shelled food or scraping off coral reefs. The next group are the Xene acanthiformes, which are known from the Devonian to Triassic. They feature long eel-like bodies with diffacircle tails. They feature claspers in males, and they have these long dorsal head spines. They likely fed in shallow water based on the stomach contents, which contained temnospondylin amphibians. Both the Xena ancanthiformes and the next group, the Tina ancanthiformes, are more closely related to modern sharks and rays. The Tina ancanthiformes are poorly known, but they feature spines on their dorsal fins and have three basal elements on the pectoral girdle, which is found in modern sharks. They are mostly known from fossilized teeth. Although known as far back as the Devonian, the Hybodontiformes are mostly known after the Permian-Triassic extinction and became common during the Jurassic. They're more closely related to modern sharks and rays and have a body that kind of closely resembles modern sharks, including an anal fin. They're also common during the Cretaceous, but went extinct with the dinosaurs at the end of the Mesozoic. Modern chondrichthians are divided into two major groups, the very strange holocephali, which includes the chimerids, and the neocelitiae, which includes sharks and rays. The holocephali, or chimerids, are a weird living group with a fossil record that extends all the way back to the Jurassic and are related to the world tooth sharks of the late Permian. They don't really look like sharks and are often called ratfish since some forms have these long whip-like tails that resemble a rat's tail. They live along the ocean floor and feed on hard-shelled invertebrates using tooth plates to crush food. There are about 40 living species. The Neocelitians are the more advanced sharks and rays that first appeared during the early Jurassic and came to dominate the oceans during the Cretaceous and throughout the later Cenozoic air. There are five groups of Neocelitians. The Gallimorpha, which includes the great white shark and the giant Miocene fossil, Carcharuncles. The Hexuncleformes, which includes the cow sharks. These are benthic deep water sharks. The Squaliformes, which includes the dogfish, a common small shark and the Squatatiniformes, which includes the monkfish, and the batoids, which includes the flat-bodied skates and rays. All of these groups became diverse during the Cretaceous and throughout the Cenozoic. In the next lecture video, we will look at what key adaptations made the Neocelitians so successful during the late Mesozoic and into the Cenozoic. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Utah State University's geology program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjaminslashberger.org. Links are found in the description below.